Thank you so much. Uh, bonjour à tous et toutes. I'm just thrilled to be here. And uh, obviously, I want to give a shout out to Mark that I got to know many years ago now when he was a grad student. And it's just been great to see his really commitment to the institution, his devo devotion to higher education is really unabated and is moving on. And, and thank you, Mark, for all your work. I also want to give a shout out. I know Vianne's not here right now, but uh, hi, Vianne. How are you? Uh, and, you know, think about her as a university president, but I think about her as someone who was just absolutely at the heart of, of my efforts when I arrived at Shirk to recognize and deal with a whole variety of challenges, but also to see some opportunities. So I'll be forever indebted to Vian Timmons, who's a great champion across Canada and internationally for the importance of studying people and possibilities of hum using better understandings of human thought and behavior in the past and present to build a better future. And, and, and that's terrific. Uh, so I, I'm here, I'd like to contribute to this by sharing with you what I think is really at the heart of uh, the issues that we've been talking about yesterday, today, and in fact are the focus of conferences across Canada internationally over the last number of years. Uh, and that is, I think for me, uh, this title presupposes two things. One is that having a narrative, the story we tell about ourselves institutions is absolutely key and is really, really important. I'm not going to unpack that, but it's, it's a presupposition of, of what we're, I think, going to deal with today. The second one is this notion that we can do better as universities, that we've been losing it at some level. Now, I'm an historian, and I'm the first one to point out that there is no golden age of universities. My first uh, introduction to this was when I was a master's student at McGill back in the day in medieval history class. And I remember I did a term paper on town and gown relations in medieval universities. Uh, and so I, I, think, I, I think we're going to think about that a bit. On the other hand, uh, I, I do think uh, there are opportunities to do better. The other possibility, and I'll have five suggestions at the end, is how we can do better and, and how we can perhaps get it back. But to start, I was thinking about this a bit, and I was thinking, well, you know, it would be good for us to think about what are some really good examples of institutions across society right now that are succeeding in terms of articulating a value proposition, what, what they're doing, why they're doing it, and that are really have a compelling narrative out there. So I thought we'd just take 60 seconds, very quickly, what jumps to mind in terms of when you think about across society out there, who do you think is really meeting the challenge of presenting a compelling narrative, what they do, why they do it? Okay, so can we do that? 60 seconds, let's go. Just call it out, and people can't hear it, I'll try to get there. Who's doing well? Apple. Apple's doing well, the company's doing well, okay. Certain community-based organizations are doing well. Pardon me? Yes, yes, voila, merci beaucoup. Okay. I don't know more. I don't know more. Okay, so the suggestion then is, I mean, there wasn't thousands that came to our mind. There, there were some examples. But the suggestion is, at least in poss potentially, uh, that, that there are, it is possible these days to present a compelling narrative. So we're going to think about that a bit. My, my first, as a, as a researcher, my first real dive into this was when I, when I got invited to uh, contribute to the Historical Atlas of Canada project and be responsible for the plates in that atlas that dealt with higher education. And I had had occasion over the years as a researcher to really think about the history of education and I was part of a group that was really focused on the emergence of mass schooling and so on. And the opportunity to look at the 20th century was, was really appealing. And, and pull together uh, material. And one of the first questions that really jumped to mind is when we think about the 20th century, should we think about the kind of rise of higher education in ways that we would think about perhaps the rise of, of mass schooling? Can we think about that? And is this sort of another version uh, of all this? And, and uh, we began to think about, okay, well, what do we know about universities in the 20th century? What can we say about that? And it turned out that there was very little research. And one of the things that was really interesting was that it was very hard to come up with studies 
that looked at what difference it made in the lives of people who went to university. Uh, and, it, and, and part of that, we embarked on a project where we looked at Queen's University that really interestingly uh, had um, uh, attempted to uh, get an understanding of incoming students by getting them to fill out a survey. All kind of interesting questions, what they thought was going to happen to them, what do they want to study, and so on. Then we knew about their actual university experience, and then we could look them up in the alumni records and find out what happened. So we did a really interesting longitudinal uh, analysis of a particular cohort. What I learned out of that was that the kind of common pictures we had of universities didn't really seem to resonate with the biographies of the individuals who actually went through, in, in, including men and women. So that was really interesting. It got me really interested in what do we really know about the meaning of higher education and, and what that's done. When I was at the University of Victoria, I got involved in an effort. University of Victoria was uh, uh, going to celebrate its 21st uh, anniversary as a university. And they said, well, how about we kind of have a conference that would uh, deal with higher education. This was in, in the earlier mid-1980s uh, when British Columbia government had, uh, you may, some of you may remember Bill van der Zam, who had decided that universities were not really the solution to all his problems. Uh, and um, there was a lot of concern about uh, uh, everything from tuition through, through uh, curriculum and, and so on. So we got together a conference, 21 countries, and what was so interesting in that process was because I became really deeply convinced that universities were living through, and in fact the larger society, a period of fundamental change. And for an historian, this was a, this was a hard uh, kind of conclusion to arrive at, because historians, as you know, our, our mission in life, anytime anyone says something's new, our mission in life is a no, 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 no. <laughs> we have seen this before. Um, and we're on the side of continuity, let's face it. Um, but I started to think, you know, wow. Uh, and the two themes we focused on in this volume was a relationship between business, the private sector, and campuses, and what we called at that time information technologies in terms of, of, of what was happening. And that was really interesting. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the subtitle, which I liked a lot better, because the university is in crisis, the word crisis, I really regret kind of using because it just became a word. But anyway, the, the notion that this was all about taking an institution that over the centuries had in fact reinvented itself many, many times was in the process of, having to, of doing it again. Uh, and I became really interested in that. In the 1990s, another dimension of that that we hadn't really worried about much earlier was this notion that there was a, a, a profound changes going on in terms of scholarly communication. And some of you may remember, you may have been involved in debates in the mid-1990s that initially focused on and were spurned by the whole notion that those journal prices were going up crazily. Those commercial publishers were killing us. And there were questions around, wow, how did it come that we developed a world in which we would do a lot of research come up with great insights and findings and so on, give them freely to the private sector, and then buy them back. Uh, like, how did that happen to us? And, there was, uh, and, and what was that meaning to us? And so on. And, and the financial side of it was loomed large. But when the, actual, uh, when, when, this, when, the, when the actual task force got going and this crisis that was really initially seen in, in frankly, financial terms, uh, came out and the, and the report that was eventually done, it's, it's fascinating, of course, none of this stuff's on the web. Anyway, um, the, one, of the, one of the big conclusions was this notion of first and foremost among these changes, phenomenal increase in the body of published knowledge. And what I found so interesting about that was the notion that, and I, even as an historian, I hadn't really embraced this idea, that it really was in the later 20th century, and probably from the 1960s on, that we really started to take seriously the challenge of understanding the world, people around us, and so on. I mean, it's fascinating, across fields. When you think about, you know, even in the natural science, engineering, physics, 
you know, the early 20th century is largely, you know, Einstein, piece of paper, having some thought experiments. But it was during the 20th century that people got really serious about that, build synchrotrons and, and, and so on. And when we think about human beings, uh, how recent we really started to get a, 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 lot, of, a lot of research. Uh, the other aspect of those, it, it was kind of, it, it got into this notion of, uh, this time it talked about in kind of uh, interesting ways, the fact that research and students in the 90s rely extensively on the internet. And this was already in the, in the mid-1990s. And, and what does that all mean in terms of the sharing of scholarly information and how does that change, uh, how does that change things? Well, it was a recent, there was a recent, a uh, couple of years ago now in, in uh, AUCC got together a workshop, some of you may have been at, and it was, the reality of the matter is that, is that it came to grips with the fact that, well, you know, hey, if you look at the, at the evidence, we can interpret it, as Michelle was, was suggesting, we can interpret this evidence and make up a pretty good story. Uh, a lot of growth, a lot of money, blah, blah, blah. You could, you could say all that, things are, are moving ahead, uh, what, what can we say? But there was also clearly that no one really was feeling that. Uh, this great success story, no one was really feeling that at, at some level. And the ideas start to emerge and, and they grasp the notion that somehow the narrative, we got to develop a new narrative. There's something we're losing here. Uh, and, and that was a, a, a focus. One of the things that's interesting and, and uh, Brian, I, I don't know if, if you were kind of implying this a bit, that it wasn't like university presidents all thought they were having a lot of fun all the time. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, I don't know if David uh, uh, or, or anybody or Linda, you know, like, been pretty frustrating. And this sense of, of losing their way. One of the things that uh, I was very sensitive about when I got appointed in 2006, somebody said to me, gee, Chad, you know, uh, it's really too bad. Now you're become, going to become the enemy of education. And I was like, ooh. That didn't really warm my heart. I thought, gee, I didn't think I was doing that. I thought I was you know, going to try to save the institution, was supporting better understanding of human beings, social science, humanity. I didn't know I was going to do that. And there was this view that, in fact, uh, the notion of grad studies, R&D, big science, and so on, they was kind of lost, and we got lost in that, what we were really, really doing. And, and you heard emerging that in all this, the real problem was our fields and social science humanities, whoa, you know, like, how are we going to do that? How are we going to pay that English prof or history prof or, or, or anybody else? And this was an international debate. It was not just in Canada, obviously. It was across, across uh, uh, many, many uh, countries. One of the things you really got increasingly now was this notion of technological disruption. Clay Christensen certainly kind of captured the imagination in terms of disruption of word, and clearly the notion was that somehow technology was disrupting higher education. We, we had to adjust to this, we had a, and it, sometimes it was seen as a great solution. Uh, then you heard for a while there was great emphasis on MOOCs, how that was really going to, you know, massive open online curriculum was really going, courses was really going to uh, save the day at some level, and this was going to be a, a, a solution to things. That didn't last long. I was interested, uh, last year you may have seen the results on this and what, what uh, institutions now think they're doing with MOOCs down here. Way at the bottom it says explore cost reduction. So only about 2% of any institution involved supporting the MOOC now thinks it's actually going to help uh, uh, financially. So we've kind of gotten over that a bit, but there still is that sense that the, the, the drivers here in terms of the financial pressures, the technological pressures, universities are reeling in this and the disruption is, is coming. So what I want to argue today, and I'm going to do it really, really quickly in a very stylized way with you to have some conversation engagement about this, is kind of a three-part argument. One is that what we're experiencing now at heart relates to deep conceptual changes. And I'm going to stylize, we're going to go real, real quickly, but, but I'm, I'm willing to go as deep as you want on that. Two, that those explain why digital technologies are so important in our lives right now, for good and bad. Why we're all sitting there 
uh, with our mobile devices and so on. And three, that in, in this context, we are reimagining higher education. We're, we are reimagining all aspects of, of what we're doing. And I would say that the kind of thinking that we're going through here related to these deep conceptual changes is across society. We're not alone. Uh, and and I, think, um, I think it's wrong to think that anybody feels real comfortable uh, and positive and confident uh, in, in the current uh, circumstance. Okay, so back to my, back to my three. I'm going to go real quick. I'm going to talk about the notion very quickly that we have fundamentally changed how we think about complexity. And, and I'm dating this from enlightenment on, but we can talk about the last few centuries, the kind of institutions we built, how we think about diversity, and how we think about creativity. And they have profound implications for how we imagine higher education and what we do, I would say, across society elsewhere, we can see them as well. Well, what do I mean by that? Complexity. I think in a nutshell, we've gone from a conviction that things may seem complex, but if we really focus on them, we can break them down, and they are inherently composed of what we can think about as simple elements. And in fact, we've moved to the notion that deep complexity, and, and you heard the word yesterday a lot, relationship, and that to break it all into pieces is, is really going to make it hard in many ways to try to understand the interconnections and the deep complexity of, of phenomena. Two, diversity. That diversity, we thought for a few centuries, was a problem, something to be eliminated. We had to get over it. And you can think about this a million different ways, whether it's nation states with languages, on and on. And now we realize that, and whether it's genetic diversity, economic diversity, on and on, there's an emerging sense that diversity is the absolute heart of resilience and strength. And three, creativity. For many centuries, we developed the notion that there are a few people in society that are going to be really creative, and the rest of us, we're going to apply that. And now we know, in fact, that um, creativity is, is not from a preordained elite, but rather can be tapped anywhere. Part of this, I would argue, and I argued it for a while, and I'm convinced about this, is that we finally started to take seriously the challenge of understanding human beings. And I think we, we don't really appreciate that yet. Uh, you know, when I think about in my field in history, when we think about all the historical interpretations, and you know, you can go back to whoever you want over the, over the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, you think about what, that, what the interpretations were based on, what evidence was being interpreted. And generally, it was amazingly modest, amazingly modest. And it's really only, I would argue, in the 1960s, really, that we started to get serious about the challenge of understanding human beings and the extent to which that is really at the heart of what we're doing. The obvious example is mass schooling. For two centuries, we built school systems. And many of you have studied this, six ways from Sunday. How recently? did we actually think about the way we did that? And, you know, everyone's looked out and seen that. I mean, hopefully we haven't looked out and seen that. <laughs> but believe me, we all thought that. And, and we're still here. So, so I think, well, so, okay, so the first part, what does that mean? When we think about this in very, very different ways, we start to understand learning, how that happens, and so on. That is why we're all struggling now to reimagine education in terms of, of the notion of transmission of knowledge. I'm real smart, here it comes, to the notion that we're not transmitting, we're not teaching content, right? That's not what we're trying to do here. And you will not learn passively sitting there. Already, I'm starting, already you're starting to think about what's for dinner. And when you leave this room, it's going to be really hard unless you, unless you focus in terms of those competencies. What, you know, what the educators started talking about, active learning is a special type of learning, and now we know it's the only one. And I use a lot of sports metaphors. You know, you say to me, okay, Chad, you know, 
I hear you play to, uh, you know, some sports, blah, blah, blah. I like to learn tennis. I said, okay, you sit there for four years and I'll talk to you about tennis. This is not going to go well. This is just not, not going to go well. So that's what we hear this all over the place. And it's a huge struggle for us. How do we get away from this? And how do we accept that, in fact, any kind of real engagement, learning, and so on can happen the way we've been doing it? For, and I think we've got to admit, why don't we get up and say, gee, we built school systems for 200 years at least, and we, and, and we didn't really do it very well. So we're going, to start, we're going to start thinking, and I know many of you are trying to do this, undergrad, and I know in history now, we've moved away from, uh, you know, this whole thing, sit there and try to learn the six reasons for World War I and regurgitate them and so on. We're trying to get students now, here's a great website, John Lutz at the University of Victoria has got students who are actually engaging with issues around race, justice, settling the land and so on by having students engage with that evidence and, and debate and discuss and so on. Terrific, terrific examples. And the other thing that's really cool about this is that this, it, this whole debate about citizenship and employability and you gotta make all these choices and so on, and only study history if you're really rich and not worried about your future. You know, it, se it seems to me at least that one of the things that's great is that in terms of having ethical judgment, integrity, intercultural skills, capacity of continued new learning and so on, all those aspects, I think what we what we're really should be up about, in fact, is, is gonna be compatible with with, with trying to contribute uh, economically. Research. For a few centuries, we got increasingly focused on the notion that, back to my complexity, in diversity and creativity, that whole notion was, okay, we just break it up in little parts. You study that little part, I'll study this little part, and then we'll add it all up and we'll understand much better the whole thing. Doesn't work. It's like a, it's a, like a jigsaw puzzle, you put it in a piece, it changes the whole puzzle. And we're just now starting to get that in, into, into and, and this whole notion, we talk about the curriculum pyramid, the, uh, and to a, what I like the word contextualization, to contextualize all, all the time what, what we're trying to uh, understand. This is the one thing from Shirk I'll show you that I did, and it just knocks me out. Okay, so here's the question. We did a survey. Many of you probably participated of this, and we, and we asked a few different questions because we really felt it was good to listen, to learn. My favorite question was about how you think about, how do you characterize your research? So this is anonymous, really rich data. Okay, we're gonna give you four answer, four possibilities here, we group them. One is exclusively disciplinary. On the left, extremely interdisciplinary. And then two in the middle. Okay, got your, got your bar graph in your head? This is 2008. <clears throat> I have yet to become anybody, it wasn't a test today, anybody who, who has accepted the fact that anonymously now, we are unable to say that we are exclusively disciplinary. It has become uncool in the extreme. <laughs> and what's so interesting about that is that humanities and social science is pretty similar. There's some differences and, and but in history, of course, I always use history just to, why not? Uh, but, the, but the similarities, cross patterns, is, is fascinating, and that raises other kinds of issues. I've been really interested in, in these new fields, medical humanities, using poetry in terms of therapy, and all kinds of really interesting, interesting approaches. Uh, this whole notion of biomedicine, humanities scholarship, these debates going on in terms of epistemology and how we think about things are just fascinating, fascinating, uh, so what are we trying to do? I mean, this was the, basically, we had a pyramid, right? The notion was, as you went up, you got increasingly specialized. And, and sometimes in Canada, as you know, we got specialized really early, less in the States and, 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 and so on. And I'm thinking about, how about an hourglass? How about we thought about more in terms of the notion of trying to combine those two? And we developed some new metaphors in terms of moving from broad to specialized to broad and trying to think about the expression that I like Discipline-based interdisciplinarity, engaged scholarship. Can we get some new metaphors? Can we think about this a bit differently? I know there are lots of you are uh, at the Congress at, at Ottawa. Historians are thinking about this, and it's it's not just a new version of the old debate that was going on for 30 years, but but a much fresher look at this. But there's some real issues, and this came out of the the McGill Conference, uh, Future Humanities. I mean, there's some. 
there's some real, real issues there. Okay, so one of the other, you know, I think the, the, the things that, that are, it's really plaguing all this that we haven't totally grasped, we had the, some years ago now, the 50th anniversary of CP Snow, but still the whole notion that somehow words and numbers, like, whoa, grade seven, that cleavage happens, it's all over. You know, our research in our field shows that, semiotically speaking, words and numbers are both representations of perceived reality, there's, there's, it's crazy to think about, I can't, be, I can't be comfortable expressing with one or the other, and so on, like, what is up with that? So we have, a, we, we have to learn a lot about this. There's a lot of evidence now that's, that's trying to get rid of these horrible dichotomies. You know, I think uh, all those dichotomies, teaching, research, you know, numbers, words, qualitative, quantitative, they don't hold up under our research, our research that we've been doing. And you look at this whole STEM thing and so on, and this was a report that just came out last spring, and it looked at, it compared, right, in terms of all the things you hear about in the news, the skills mismatch, salary, unemployment, global rank, in terms of our graduates, very hard to tell apart what the, what, what the undergrads have studied. So how did we let that narrative get away from us? How did it come that somehow we kind of gave up? Oh yes, if you study those fields, you want a job. If you study history, you're virtuous. Well, hold on, the data certainly doesn't, doesn't suggest that that's the big choice that we have to make, and we let that get away from us. And it's interesting now that we're just trying to get serious about this, and it goes back to my Queen's University at the turn of the century. I think it's surprising to know ourselves is a good start in terms of thinking about all this. The last one I, entered, I want to mention briefly is the whole campus community. Universities, basically from the 70s on, developed this whole notion that they're gonna help make a better society by giving them a better widget. And everything got into this tech transfer kind of connection. But we've, we've abandoned that. We know now that in fact, uh, trying to make a better world, whether it's better schools or, 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 or better health or better anything, businesses, anything, it's all about a much bigger engagement. It's a much bigger kind of engagement. It's across all disciplines. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a, a way of thinking about Innovation, trying to make a better world, that is an integrated way, and it's people-centered. It understands that uh, it's all about, at the end of the day, uh, people. And there's lots of efforts. Bud Hall, who's one of my heroes in terms of how his efforts to cheerlead across Canada and show intellectually as well as practically how we can think about this, uh, the whole notion of community-based uh, research. But that's not coming out of... I think what's interesting, that's not coming out of charity, that's not coming out of like, you know, oh, we've decided we've got to give back. No, this is a new way of thinking about how we advance understanding and make a better world. That is to say, it's simply better. It's, it's, it's moving us quicker. It's going to get us to better understandings, whether it's of the past or present or how to go forward. It's, it's, it seems to me, and we have to kind of embrace that uh, as, a, as a way of, of, of thinking about, uh, I think, all of this. Historians are trying now to get to realize that historical perspectives on all the big issues of the day, whether it's environment or, or, or you name it, is absolutely key, and we've got to get engaged in that, become part of that, and collaborate, partner uh, with, with the larger uh, with the larger society. At the Congress I mentioned, Justice Sinclair uh, made a wonderful presentation, but to some extent, it might have been a bit surprising because what does he come out and say? Given the residential schools and on and on, he comes out and says education is the answer. And universities have a huge role to play in this. Uh, and, and that the ball is now in our court. Uh, and, and I think uh, we must respond. We're rethinking that whole scholarly communication, the response to trying to help make a better world is not gonna happen in terms of a uh, you know, uh, journal article for our six colleagues. That uh, It's not gonna work. And, and I was really pleased, I got back to University of Ottawa on their website now, the library is kind of re trying to rethink that in terms of a much more robust notion of, of uh, scholarly communication. We're trying to get away from the medium, and I like to think about this in terms of reimagining what we're doing. It's not about the article or the book. It's about the key work that was actually going on here is the generating, the filtering, and the curation of knowledge, ideas, insights, and sharing them. 
That's what it's about. And, and the means to that is not the thing we either should be counting or, or so on. It's a, it's a very different kind of thing. We're trying to get there. I know yesterday there were good discussions in the round table about how we do that. We've got a lot of work to do on that score. And it's been alluded to many, many times. All metric is part of it, but there are many others as well. One little hiccup here, though, which kind of, so the University of Ottawa said, okay, fine, open access, we're going to help, we're going to give a bit of money in terms of helping people publish in open access journals, something that I don't agree with, but anyway, they're going to do that, okay, fine, that's going to really help, and then we get a memo that says, oh, by the way, there's no more money in the fund, <laughs> sorry about that. So that wasn't very cool, but anyway, so the business model of this, shall we say, uh, has some work to do, but the whole notion that we're gonna produce work uh, for the public and then give it to a commercial publisher to buy it back, like, we did that, folks. We did that, so let's stop it soon. Okay, so what do we do? Five things, and I'm gonna go really, really quickly. First one, let's get over those, like, those, those kind of false distinctions those, those crazy ways of thinking about things that worked maybe in the, in the 20th century, I don't think they did, but anyway, and focus on an integrated advanced learning. And the notion that when uh, students learn something that's teaching and when profs learn something that's research, it's crazy. So let's embrace this notion, we heard that a lot yesterday, and it's not just on campus, it's by society. Society wants to learn. Let's help engage, let's participate, let's all move forward together. So what are some of the implications about all this? One, we've got to do much better. The old explanation we had about why uh, uh, the link between teaching and research, that doesn't work anymore. It doesn't, it, it, we're all in, I think, a, it's a different enterprise. We've got to reframe that. Similarly, this campus community connection. There's no knowledge transfer. There's no like, here it comes, folks. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collaboration. It's an integrated it's a, it's a collective pursuit, particularly in a world of complexity, diversity, creativity, in which, and crowdsourcing on and on, Smithsonian Institution is realizing this, and many institutions now that are realizing that uh, it's not the experts and a bunch of appliers and so on. Second, universities are reconceptualizing the undergrad and grad programs, getting away from the peer. I mean, these are, I like hourglass in the minute, I don't know, nobody else seems to like it so far, but, but I think it's a good, <laughs> it's a better way to think about it it's a better way, it's a better kind of metaphor. I like specialization, contextualization. I like this notion of, it doesn't, I would say it doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter. Whether at the end of the day your focus is history or chemistry or whatever, at the end of the day, you should come out of this with an integrated kind of learning and, and focus not on what to think, but ways of thinking, critically, analytically, creatively, in competencies, how to form meaningful questions, multiple ways to address them, how to partner, collaborate, listen, listen, contribute. Okay, implications, prop-student ratio. It's a much better notion of, of thinking about that, and I think we've let that get away from us in, in bad ways. Experiential learning, all the success of that in various ways. Let's unpack that, let's document that, let's say why it works and how it fits in terms of how we think about this learning, and obviously student engagement, and we can't just talk about that. Okay, so let's go. 19th and 20th century approach to research, which again is, is breaking into particles, make it little, and focus, and then we'll add it up later, doesn't work. Discipline-based, interdisciplinary, community-engaged initiative that enhance learning of all involved, whether you're on campus or not. I think it's absolutely key implications there. Increase the initiative in terms of enabling both vertical, department, faculty, because we are gonna have departments, you know, however we think about that. We can't have a big mush, it's not a big soup. We're gonna divide, we're gonna, we have to. It's the only way we organize our lives. But we have to do it in ways that I like the no metaphor of T-shaped that are specific but also connected and horizontal across campus, cam uh, campus community. And I, and I think that's happening. We've got to say that. We've got to talk about that. And, and obviously merit review in terms of how we think about that. And, and our, you know, I would say, and I used to say this at the Research Council, don't count money received as an indicator of anything. Money enables research. I, I'm real interested in what happens with all that. I don't, you know, anyway, I'll stop. Okay, <laughs> fourth, how and why university contribution to the larger post-secondary landscape? The specific one of universities, okay, is on the mid to longer term. 
David uh, said this this morning, and I know Brian says that a lot. Not only on first job, but career, citizenship, community. Not only on familiar questions, but those not yet imagined. Thought, and I think universities, and, and I know Vian is doing this increasingly, thought, uh, thought leadership. Get the debate going in the public square uh, and contribute in, in those ways. So what does that mean? I think we've got to stop. Come to our, our university, study this, and you'll get job within. Forget that. That's not, I don't think, this whole first job objective. I think we've got to downplay that. It gets hurt us. I think we have to say, yes, what's going on on campus does relate to the headlines, but it also relates to things that we haven't even thought about in, in, in unexpected ways. We, uh, it's, it's, it's part of what we do in terms of our mid and long term focus. The insights and evidence that speak to, to current, we have to contribute that. We have to, we have to share that. We have to engage on that. Uh, and I think the other thing is this, this knowledge filtering and curation. I think it's absolutely responsible. Universities now have a, a key role in this. Filtering is going to happen, but it can't just happen with a Google algorithm. It has to happen, and it's going to happen in ways that reflect our devotion uh, uh, to this. And, and obviously, we have to tell our story. We have to show what happened. And I think the forensic approach is really good on this, to think, look back, and, and see this. And, 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 I, and then on the other hand, don't oversell. And boy, this is a danger, and we'll come back to this, trying to claim that we're going to solve uh, too, way too much. Five, the distinctive feature of universities, primary focus on advancing knowledge and understanding of the past and present as a public good. Let's just say that. We're in Canada. We're public institutions, and I would argue even in the States we're public institutions, and many, even to a considerable extent, given uh, lots of studies showing how much public money goes into even the so-called private institutions. Anyway, in pursuing this, universities prepare students for enhanced contributions to the larger society, cultural, social, and economic, and in expected and unexpected ways. Universities contribute knowledge and understanding to efforts to make a better future. So what are the implications? We really have to focus on the diffuse and pervasive public contributions of, I would say, I don't like counting patents, spin-offs. It's, it's like, don't do that. Transform our tech transfer offices into the knowledge mobilization and engagement centers. And I know many of you have been involved in that and that welcome community partners that, that see that in, a, in an integrated way. Alan Shepard, uh, uh, like, like uh, Vianne, is, is I think one of the really effective university presidents these days. And, and there are many in the room. I saw Ralph, where's Ralph? Ralph Nielsen, uh, Vancouver Island University is doing some great things. The government was here yesterday. I don't see him today. Uh, but look at the list here, folks. They students will need financial or science, appreciate culture, capacity, hope. I think my one concern here is let's not think we can do it all. Let's get, let's get reasonable. We're contributing too. We're trying to help, but, but let's not guarantee, because I'm real worried the universities could end up with the, and with the same kind of um, suspicion and whatever of elementary schools that claim too much, high schools that can claim too much, let's not oversell. But this is a great uh, way of, of thinking about what's really needed in terms of global citizens as we go forward. I'm going to end with Northrop Fry. I always love Northrop Fry because I think it's really important for us to, to embrace the notion that, yes, uh, where we are now, we have to deal with that. We have, to, we have to think that through. We have to analyze the past, present, how we got here, and so on. But the really important work is to imagine the future we want and then to begin to identify some of the steps forward we can take to get there. Thank you so much. for that chat. Um, I have two questions just to uh, press you a little harder and a couple of the, the broad and very stimulating characterizations you made. Uh, there, there seems to be a, a, a contradiction or at least an alarming conjunction of the explosion of the desire to understand human beings. 
that the category of the human begins to fill the screen and elicit all sorts of activity from various quarters, that that moment of the explosion of interest could be seen as also the moment of the imminent diminishment and demise of the, of the humanities. I would like you to look at the conjunction between the human and, and the humanities. You also figured among, uh, you also recognized a shift in the understanding of diversity as problematic contamination or impurity to uh, diversity as the value connected to resilience and so on. In, why is it that you mark that as a shift to the revaluing of diversity when we are all captive to the ultimate monoculture of market fundamentalism? That is that the economic domain seems to be so powerful, so ubiquitous, in the very place which is so virulently intolerant to the notions of diverse economic activity. Okay, so great question. Thank you very much, Len. Uh, I think that, in fact, uh, it could go, all of this could go horribly wrong. Uh, I love Michelle's optimism about this. We're going to win and, and so on. And, and when I put my head on my pillow at night, I like to believe that. But um, as my historian side also kicks in and says, you know what? Uh, I don't think, I'm not sure at all. And so I think, uh, I think this could go horribly wrong in, in the 21st century. And I think it links, in fact, to your second point. Uh, absolutely. I think that uh, if we don't abandon notions of some powerful group that's controlling everything and we can't do much, uh, I think we're, we're down. If, if we really believe that there's a monoculture that's railroading us and we may as well give it up, I think we're, we're done. And it's interesting, in, in, in my fields in history, we've spent 50 years and I'm unaware of, and maybe someone can tell me, I'm unaware of any PhD thesis that's been accepted in the last 50 years in the humanities where the central conclusion was, wow, here's a bunch of people that are victims, they all laid down, and that was horrible. Instead, whether it's back to the 1960s in terms of uh, women's history, uh, at that time, uh, history of slavery, I remember, had a big, and, and on and on. The story has been about the fact that even in the worst circumstances, people did struggle, they resisted, they used religion, they used all sorts of means, and, if we, and, and their histories and so on cannot be just thrown away and erased as, as, as disasters and so on, right? So, so I think the notion that us as university profs are really unable to play a key role in terms of trying to make this go well, I find is, 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 is in terms of our research and our fields and the humanities especially, is kind of hard for me to swallow. And so I think we can do it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I also understand that it, it may not work at all. Yes. You expressed reservations about uh, university libraries supporting publishing and open access journals. Could you briefly elaborate on why you're concerned about that? Well, I, 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 and my, my punchline on this is I think universities have got to get back control of the, 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 the curation and what they call the discovery aspect of that. I think that uh, uh, the notion, the, the trouble that university presses, for example, have had in the last few decades has been a profound misunderstanding of the value proposition of universities. The, at the heart of the value proposition of, of universities is on the, on the notion of, of really contributing to the, to the development of, 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 of learning, and, that in, that, and that's basically in, in, the, in that world would be content. And to simply give that to someone else and then have libraries try to finance the reacquisition of it is crazy. So, so I think we've got to, I would like libraries to become not the, simply the, the repositors of all that, but to collaborate with us, and, and I think a lot of the good ones are now, in terms of that filtering work and so on, the whole peer review process on and on, and then making that accessible to the larger world. And I think university, and libraries, university libraries now, I think 
have to play a central intellectual scholarly role on campuses in ways that go way beyond the notion of custodians of books or journal art, journals. Um, thanks very much, Chad. I've had the uh, opportunity to hear you over, uh, you know, many, many times in the last he didn't say too many. number of years <laughs> he was in your shirk role, and I all I have to say is uh, welcome home. <laughs> I think your uh, the, the liberation I've even tweeted, and you'll probably get in trouble, but I've uh, I've uh, tweeted that I think uh, the Chad Gaffield has been liberated. Uh, <laughs> but I think that your the experience that you've had, <clears throat> you know, with shirk. It not only gives you probably a, a very dark insight into the current government, but it also gives you a kind of a national exposure to different kinds of things. And so I'm just wondering where you think. I was, I was talking with Len at the break, and I, I said, this is the first space that I've been in in the last number of years, um, you know, ever, I guess, in, here in Canada where, you know, people really talking about reimagining, you know, the university, restructuring, you know, all of the different words we use, decolonizing and so forth. And I'm just wondering how we, where we go. So given, you know, your kind of knowledge of some of the different spaces where higher educators or uh, other people kind of gather together, um, or your sense of, uh, you know, of how, uh, you know, how, ch how change can happen in this world. Do you have any any thoughts about uh, how we how we take the kind of spirit uh, from you know these few days here and uh, you know build that to something that really uh, makes sure that you know that well that at least that we do everything we possibly can you know to 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 make the, the public in public education and public higher education uh, meaningful. Thank you very much, but I, I appreciate that. So if anything that you leave today, I think we should leave, uh, leave with the notion that we are not telling the story of how we are now, not everywhere, but many of us in many corners are reimagining education, the way we're imagining our curriculum, our syllabus, and so on, is, is not what it was. 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, that we are, are reimagining that. Similarly, in terms of research, we are not, how we're attempting to advance knowledge and understanding, how we're trying to learn about different aspects of the past. We have not shared the notion that we have reimagined that. We have rethought that and, and to communicate that in, in what, what that means. And similarly, we have not really uh, you know, told that we have uh, told and explained why universities, I don't think the notion of a metaphor of an ivory tower was ever true. However, universities now recognize that all of us are citizens, all of us are members of that society. The questions that we ask in our research, what we're doing is reflective of the world we live in and so on, that, that those dichotomies never worked well, and that therefore we're trying to think about this in very different ways, we're trying to engage in very different ways, and we understand, I think, that we're going to advance knowledge and understanding and make a better world in very different ways than a while ago, at the same time as we recognize that we built policies and practices in, a, in an era in, in, in which they're alive and well. They're living, and, and we're fr frankly reluctant sometimes to get rid of them, uh, and we just keep doing them. So, so my, sense, <laughs> my sense is that if we tell the story about those pockets, those, those, those things that are happening, percolating up, and if we do everything we can to get rid of the obstacles and the barriers and, and, and so on, and then we tell that story, I think it's going to be an, a huge step forward. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.